Welcome, everyone, uh, to the first in a series of reopen virtual roundtables. These meetings are designed to keep Connecticut residents informed about how we are thinking about bringing back our communities and our businesses, and to answer the questions that, that are at the top of people's minds. My name is Mark Jakian, and I am the president of the Connecticut State Colleges and Universities. Governor Lamont has asked me to serve as the lead in his overall reopening efforts of Connecticut's colleges and universities. And I am delighted to co-host today's event with my friend and colleague, Commissioner Miguel Cardona. We are focused today on the planning efforts toward reopening Connecticut's in-person education system, including early childhood, K through 12, and higher education. Last week, uh, Governor Lamont shared the criteria for the state's initial reopening, which centered around decreased hospitalizations, increased testing and contact tracing capabilities, healthcare capacity, and workplace safeguards. These guidelines reflect the science-based and data-driven approach that the state is taking. And these protocols will serve as a guide about when we resume in-person instruction and how we reopen our college campuses. It is important to note that while Connecticut is a small state, there is a tremendous amount of diversity among our institutions of higher education. With that in mind, the higher education reopen guidelines are not a one size fits all approach. Though they are just a few miles away, Southern Connecticut State University might have significantly different needs than Yale, which might have significantly different needs than Gateway Community College. I know that all our higher education leaders appreciate the ability to take their own institutional needs into account while working within a framework developed by public health experts. And that is critically important because the health of our students, faculty, staff, and everyone who works on our campuses must and will be our top priority. With that in mind, today's conversation will focus on education from early childhood to higher education. I am very much looking forward to today's discussion. And with that, I'd like to ask my colleague, Commissioner Cardona, to say a few welcoming remarks. Miguel? Thank you, uh, President Ojekian. Uh, glad to be here with you all, and uh, thank you for joining and for listening in. Uh, my name is Miguel Cardona. I'm the Commissioner of Education, and like uh, Mr. Ojekian, we, I oversee the uh, pre-K through grade 12 reopening efforts with a wonderful team. We recognize the sense of urgency to plan for the recovery of student learning loss and returning to in-school classes and extracurricular activities. The advisory team was formed to create a broad framework mapping out the next steps to navigate the remainder of the school year and prepare for the 2020-2021 school year and summer programming in a way that prioritizes the health and safety of our students, our educators, and our entire staff. Regarding commencement of summer school and the feasibility of reopening schools in the fall, so much will depend on infection trends in Connecticut, and we learn about best practices to maintain a safe learning environment within our schools. Guidance on graduations will be forthcoming um, in accordance with the latest executive order. We want to make sure we're adhering to the executive orders while understanding how important this is for not only our students who are graduates, but also their families. We understand that the road to recovery for school districts will in many ways be unique based on the variance of district characteristics across Connecticut. As we work to address the questions and decisions necessary to reopen school buildings safely, we will engage parents, teachers, school leaders, policymakers, and student voice throughout the process. This moment in time has created an opportunity to transform our approach to equitable education for all learners. Equity and access undergirds everything we do as a state. Four statewide priorities include assuring that students have access to appropriate technology and connectivity, 
access to high quality curriculum that addresses the needs of all learners, including students with disabilities, addressing student learning gaps and safely reopening schools, and then the important social emotional supports that students need as they trans transition back to school. With input from our stakeholders, we look forward to supporting a safe and productive reopening in Connecticut. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dr. Matthew Carter. I'm with the Connecticut Department of Public Health, and I'm the state epidemiologist. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, this is where I've been asked to talk a little bit about this virus and what we might expect to see. Um, I think it's really important to look forward to reopening. Uh, clearly, there's a huge desire for us to feel a return to something like normal. But I also know that many people are viewing the reopening with trepidation. Uh, like yourselves, I've gotten many emails in the past few days from people about school graduations to uh, uh, hairdressers and salons and uh, a whole host of issues about people who have concerns about what's ahead. And what's happening next, the reopening, is the next phase. I know we talk about sa being safe. One of the things that will be a challenge for us is something I call sort of risk tolerance. Um, we are going to continue to see transmission of this virus through the summer. Um, and it is quite likely that we will see a second wave of this pandemic as well uh, in the fall. And so our plans need to be flexible enough to be able to turn rapidly and adjust to that a particular setting. Um, there is a, thinking about pandemics is not like a weather forecast. We don't have those kind of tools that tell us exactly what's going to happen. But we need to be able uh, to, one, plan for reopening, but at the same time, also plan for the return of COVID-19 in a second wave, uh, uh, perhaps in the fall. And uh, uh, both of those things have to happen at the same time. And that's one of the things that I'm, I'm really urging people to uh, uh, to think about is to the need to be flexible, the need to adjust to what's happening in our communities, uh, and the need to perhaps change plans if we need to. But we also know that we need to return our students to classes and how best to do that. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you to President Ojekian, Commissioner Cardona, and Dr. Carter for those opening remarks. My name is Chris Soto, Director of Innovation and Partnerships for the State Department of Education. I'm going to be moderating this discussion, and I'm going to briefly share what this is going to look like. So we've had uh, hundreds of questions come in that I think are at the tops of minds of people. Thank you to everybody that's joining us from around the state. And so we're going to jump right in. We have a bunch of stakeholders who represent uh, thousands of, of constituents from around the state. And so we're going to start with our K-12 and summer camp and early childhood um, focuses right now. And then we're going to wrap that up with our K-12 conversation. And so I want to start with uh, a gentleman, um, uh, Glenn Lungarini, who's on with us. And that first question um, has really revolved around um, sports. And so, Glenn, um, can you talk a little bit about um, what the planning and conversations look like around when we start returning to uh, fall sports? Hello, Mr. Soto, Commissioner Cardona, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to share our thoughts today. The CIAC has been uh, actively working uh, both with the uh, State Department of Education, superintendents, boards of education, uh, health department, and the Connecticut State Medical Society Sports Med Committee to evaluate not only uh, where we are right now, but where we were uh, in the winter and what we need to look forward to uh, as we continue uh, to look forward to the uh, opening of schools in the uh, in the fall. Uh, as we do this, we are engaging all of the stakeholders that were previously mentioned, uh, in addition to our coaches association and athletic directors. We feel it's essential to remember that uh, high school sports are academic based, meaning that uh, we first must focus on a return to school and successful resocialization to our curriculum 
and education. And after that time, uh, then we can consider uh, how we get back to our sports, understanding how important school sports and athletics are to our high school students. Uh, so we will continue to work with this. We will be uh, issuing some more guidance through the CIAC, uh, what those resocialization to athletic uh, criteria will look like, and we'll do so in partnership with Commissioner Cardona, the State Department of Education, and Governor Lamont's office. Thank you, Glenn. Um, and I think the biggest biggest word there is is reopening, just in general, as we talk about the fall. And so I want to shift um, to to Don and Jan, who who represent teachers. And so um, as we zoom out a little bit, what are the biggest concerns? And I'll start with Don first. What are the biggest concerns that you're hearing from teachers about uh, reopening schools in the fall, Don? Uh, thank you, Chris. In terms of what what's on teachers' minds right now, uh, they miss being in the classroom. They miss their students terribly. Uh, they would love nothing better than to get back to quote normal uh, and be educating their students in the classroom. And they're concerned deeply about the health and safety of students, of other teachers and staff, uh, and of the parents and families in their community. Uh, so what they're what they're really concerned about is that we have the protocols. Uh, if testing, if possible, uh, in the fall, uh, we don't know what that situation is is going to entail and whether tests will be uh, available. Uh, at the same time, the physical barriers will be very important. The social distancing, wearing of masks those types of protections. And if you think about it, that begins when students get on the school bus, when they arrive at school, when they walk down the halls, when they enter the classroom. Uh, many folks are saying that those numbers will have to be reduced, that the class sizes will have to be reduced, the numbers of students riding school buses will have to be reduced accordingly so that they, we can have the social distancing uh, that is required. Uh, what's most important is that we get this right uh, from a health and safety point of view, uh, because even though students are not showing up as a, a statistic in terms of, like the elderly, where they are, are severely impacted by the virus in greater numbers, uh, we are learning every day uh, that children nonetheless are impacted, especially children with respiratory problems, and there's a number of children right now that are otherwise healthy, that are suffering from inflammation to the heart. These are reports that are just coming out right now. So we're very concerned about that. So bottom line is teachers want to get back into the classroom uh, and recreate that bond uh, with their students, but they want us to do this right because the last thing we want is to reopen and have schools serve as a center for actually spreading the virus come the fall that could result in shutting back down not only schools, but parts of our economy. So that's what they're concerned about. Great, thank you, Don. And Jan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I know you also represent teachers. Is there is there anything that are at the top of teachers' minds and maybe something that Don didn't say also that you'd like to share? Sure, um, I do have to reiterate what Don said that the the biggest concern on every educator's mind is the safety um, and as Don said they do want to get back to school you know we had a survey and our teachers said that distance learning is not effective in the long term 75 percent of our teachers say that even though their workload has increased and they're doing their best that students face too many obstacles like parents that aren't able to assist them um, they can't keep up for various reasons um, they don't have the skills or the knowledge to utilize the online um, technology and our educators are telling us that even though our students are accepting this situation, they're stressed, they're frustrated, and they're very confused. So teachers do want to go back to work into their classrooms, but of course safety has to be number one. And they are again concerned about the protections that will be, um, will they be enforced and how will um, that look like in our new school settings? And mostly they're concerned about how they're going to do their jobs. Educators are worried about the resources of the jobs. You know, let's face it, there's been a lot of talk about the state and municipal budgets. And, you know, will they have the resources to be successful for, for classes like art and music and shop? And these are the courses that many of our most at-risk students um, go to and keep them engaged. And they're very concerned about our paraeducators. You know, will they be in our schools? 
and because they support our most vulnerable students. So they're concerned whether elected officials will fund our future. And with that come com concerns about equity um, and access to technology for all students, you know, most educators expect that school will look different and feel different as they go through this. There will be a hybrid of in-person and distant learning. You know, what will that look for, like for educators who are parents and not able to be there for their children and for parents who work multiple jobs just to survive? They're concerned about, you know, how they'll pro provide the remediation that's going to be necessary. Educators are scanning the internet and looking for the most effective practices. They're watching what other districts and what, what other states are doing. And they're looking for the answers for how this crisis will impact public education in the future. And they just want to be part of the conversation and the solution. Thank you, Jan. And you know, you brought up a big point around budgets, and I think that's a good segue um, to one of the big challenges that we're going to be facing as as we look at uh, reopening schools in the fall. So I want to turn to to Bob Rader, who's on with us, that represents uh, boards of education. Bob, can you tell us um, what are some of the challenges that your members have been talking about specifically to budgets and how they're going to be grappling that? Obviously, uh, municipal budgets intertwine with school budgets. And so if you can share some of those perspectives, that'd be great. Sure. Um, and thank you again, uh, Chris and and, uh, and Commissioner Cardona. Uh, our school districts are very nervous about what will happen. With all the discussion about the importance of social distancing, physical distancing, whatever uh, somebody wants to call it, we, school districts are very concerned about how they will run uh, just on a logistical basis. They will need to have classrooms in which kids are uh, far enough apart. They will need to have enough buses so kids can stay far enough apart. And those are some of the things we're looking at. Obviously, one of the big concerns is social emotional learning. We are very concerned about teachers going back to work as well as our students who have found this to be somewhat traumatic. It was unexpected. It came up quickly. Uh, staying at home and trying to distance learn uh, is very, very difficult. Um, our schools will also have to pay for technology, for perhaps uh, more people to help with various uh, different things in the classroom. Um, our school districts are worried about uncertainty. When you talk about budgets that are going up, maybe one or or at the most one and a half or two percent, um, there just isn't going to be the resources, at least from the local towns. So we are calling on the state to do more. And besides that, I just want to mention that it's very important that districts have some kind of immunity from uh, liability, just like uh, has been suggested in the higher education uh, plan for the future. So all these things are going on as districts and boards are working with their superintendents to try to find the best solutions to very, very difficult problems that are all laced with some kind of uncertainty. Thank you, Bob. And I think, you know, one of the things that stood out to me of what you said there was around student needs. And, um, you know, I want to turn it over to Fran Rabinowitz, who represents superintendents. I know that Fran hears from superintendents every day who, who are hearing directly from students, you know, and specifically you talked about social emotional learning, Bob, um, you know, talk about distance learning. We've, we've been, you know, experiencing that all through this spring. So Fran, can you talk about some of the challenges that the superintendents have been dealing with? And then as we think about moving into the fall, what some of those challenges are gonna present um, in this new reality? Good morning and thank you, Chris. And thank you to all the stakeholders that have um, such a concern for uh, quality education in Connecticut. I would say to you that Dr. Carter um, encapsulated exactly what I was thinking in talking about flexibility. And our um, superintendents and educators have had to be incredibly flexible. We've had to pivot from um, uh, brick and mortar to distance learning. And in all of this, certainly the health and safety of our children has been the greatest um, concern for all of us. But 
Let me just say one thing, and that is what keeps us awake at night is being able to um, reach and engage every child. And we know that during this time, we've had a very difficult time doing that with, um, with some of our children. And that is a major concern. So our students with disabilities, for example, we have not been able to successfully reach all of them. We've worked and teachers have done incredible work as well as social workers, et cetera, trying to reach all children. But um, we still know that there's been some learning loss and um, some mental health issues. The same is true of those children that we haven't been able to reach because they don't have um, um, the equipment to engage with us in distance learning or um, the internet access, et cetera. So we are um, working incredibly hard to plan for scenarios. Our best hope is that we will have some type of in-person learning in, um, in the fall. And we're very hopeful that maybe we'll even be able to begin that in the summer. So our challenge is um, being able, keeping in mind that it is our moral responsibility to reach every child and give every child um, the um, opportunity to have a, um, an effective education. How do we do that? And what type of scenarios do we plan um, for the summer and for the fall so to engage um, all children um, across the state? Thank you, Fran. You know, you, you brought up a, a point that, that I think is very critical to this conversation. Um, you said summer and you also brought up learning loss. And, and on, on the line with us right now, we have Commissioner Beth Bai. And I think it's important that we hear from her specifically around the significance of, of summer programming. And, and I think right now there's a, a huge spotlight on the importance of that summer programming. So I'm wondering um, Commissioner Bai, if you could jump in now and talk to us about the significance of that summer program and, and what we can do to ensure that, that those avenues um, are there for students. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Fran, and uh, also to our uh, distinguished commissioners and college presidents on the line. Uh, most importantly, to the folks out there who are listening and who can continue to give us feedback and give guidance to this group. Um, we are listening and we are working uh, to adapt to your needs. I think we're in a situation where there's not always a right answer. There are often less worse answers. Um, so I wanted to let folks out there know what the decision of the reopen education um, subcommittee was around summer programming, um, recognizing the health concerns that some have expressed, but also the flip side is the health concerns of kids being home without supervision, um, without uh, some of the structure and routine that their brains rely on, um, is that uh, summer camps, this committee decided, will be able to open on June 29th, uh, which will provide parents with much needed childcare uh, so they can get to work, but they'll be open with strict public health guidelines. And a number of camps have been opening as childcare uh, already, and those Few will remain open uh, along with childcare in the state. Uh, there'll be very small group sizes, class sizes of 10, and uh, small program sizes, uh, program sizes of 30 children per program. Uh, but programs that have a lot of space and can demonstrate that they can take more than 30 children um, can apply uh, to our agency uh, to get a waiver and be allowed to open with more children. It's really a matter of the campus in many cases. And we've also encouraged the public schools that host camps, uh, this committee is encouraging them to please make that space available because uh, this is critical uh, for families. Um, so um, Chris, did you have anything further or does that answer that question? No, that, that answers that. But I, I think um, also important um, that you made me think about is really making the distinction between summer camps and, and childcare, right? And, 
and also recognizing why it's critical that we have childcare open, why it remained open as soon as, as the pandemic started um, and, and the critical need that it serves in communities. And so if you could just speak a little bit to that, because I think there has been some criticism on why it stayed open um, and why you know childcare is open, but schools are closed. And so if you could speak to that, I think it's important for people to hear. Sure, and I think that goes back to, to what I just said as we're making our best decisions in response to this uh, public health emergency. I don't know that there's a distinction for most families between childcare and summer camp. Uh, for many families, summer camp is their childcare. And what we've done working with the Department of Public Health and CDC guidance is uh, try to develop guidelines uh, that allow camp to go on within those um, parameters. As for childcare, uh, Governor Lamont was really clear at the beginning that childcare was to remain open as part of the public health response. Now, he didn't require them to stay open, which some states did, and so many did close. Uh, they closed at a pace uh, with which parents could make other arrangements, and uh, probably a little under 30% of childcare centers are open, and about 60% of family childcare homes are open. Uh, we worked with Dr. Carter on clear public health guidance for programs. If they were to be open, they had to follow a clear public health guidance, which again is small groups um, so that there's more space per classroom per child and also small center program sizes, um, which we've been able to work with programs uh, on uh, helping them assure the public health guidance. Uh, also, children are screened on the way in for temperature. Uh, to make sure they don't have a temperature of 100 or more, and there's enhanced cleaning. Again, following the CDC guidelines and working with the Department of Public Health uh, to come up with those guidelines. Child care has really been part of the public health response. I keep saying that because uh, you know Governor Lamont knew what was happening in the nursing homes as people were calling out sick because schools had closed, new workers and temporary workers were going in, and that just brings in more people into that setting. Um, of the calls that we've gotten to 211 child care saying, I need help with child care, more than half have been hospital workers. Um, this might not occur to the general public, but people, people are anxious. About, well, everyone understands anxiety, but uh, health care workers are having a hard time finding child care. Um, and so these we've opened up centers at 26 <laughs> 26 sites for 29 hospitals, um, in addition to the existing child care supply. So we know that the people looking for child care are number one hospital workers, and number two on the two on one call list are nursing home workers. And I think I don't have to explain much more to say to the public um, how important those workers are at this time. But I do like to say to the public that we've got to recognize the child care teachers, who are some of the lowest paid. Uh, individuals and professionals in our state are putting themselves on the front lines, taking care of our children, working to keep everyone uh, safe and healthy and maintaining that structure and routine for those kids whose parents are on the front lines. Um, just a little more data to say that uh, we've opened up a program that the public should know about that is allowing frontline workers to get three weeks of a child care subsidy. If you're a frontline worker and need help uh, paying for child care or finding child care, you can call 211 child care um, and uh, you can get that subsidy. And more than uh, we have more than 6,000 essential workers who are being covered um, by our federal dollars. Uh, their child care programs are being supported to stay open, and another thousand families who are receiving a child care subsidy so that they can go out and be on the front line. So I think it's different in that. We're able to maintain very small groups and small classes and also follow the strict public health guidance. Um, all of this has been informed by public health, and I think we owe a big debt of gratitude to our child care providers. I hope that answers your question, Chris. No, that was great. I think um, that that quote that you said, child care is part of the public health response, really resonates. And as we think about teachers going back in the fall, um, it, it even... Um, resonates even more because um, we're going to need that child care in place um, as teachers go back. And so I want to turn it over to the commissioner um, before we shift gears to our, our uh, higher ed partners. Commissioner, did you have anything else maybe that, that you wanted to add on from what you've heard, maybe synthesizing some of these thoughts? 
Sure, thank you. You know, you, you, you hear the different perspectives from the members of the pre-K to 12 group, and, and you know they're listening to their constituents. They're listening uh, to folks on the in the field. Um, and it's critically important that whatever decisions we make, we're listening. Uh, we, we have to spend a lot of time listening before we come up with planning. Um, so, you, you know, one group of, uh, of people that we're all indebted to are the parents that have done everything to try to keep their students engaged in learning despite having to go to work and then come home and, and try to help their children on, on topics that, you know, they, they might not be as comfortable with. So thank you parents for, for stepping up also. Uh, it's been remarkable. Um, we heard a lot about safety and, and I think it's critically important to remember this is a public health issue. So the efforts that we do to reopen have to be based on what we know, uh, what we're hearing about this pandemic. We're learning more things every day. We've We've only been going through this for four months. It's only four months old. So we're learning more and more. And we wanna make sure that above all, we're protecting your children, we're protecting our staff, uh, we're protecting our communities. Because as was mentioned earlier, um, if done uh, without taking that into account, it's, there's a greater likelihood that we're gonna to have to reclose again. And we, we wanna be smart about this. Uh, we're taking the input of our health uh, officials as well. I wanna thank the educators also that um, throughout the whole district, you know, we've fed over 4 million students in Connecticut over the last month and a half. Uh, 4 million meals have gone out. Um, teachers overnight have had to change how they do business overnight to make sure that students are getting access. So while we know that there are students that we haven't reached or we haven't been able to connect with them the way we want to, we know that overnight we've uh, done miraculous work to try to connect with our students and keep the learning going. We're not done. Um, we, you've heard good perspective. Uh, and we're going to continue to listen to perspectives to make sure that we're making the best decisions. And, and I just want to close by saying, you know, we're, we're going to continue to listen and we're going to make the best decisions to ensure that we have a, a reopening that is safe and that provides quality opportunities for students to continue to learn. So I want to thank you for the opportunity. And those who are listening, thank you for listening and thank you for submitting your questions. Those are going to help guide our work moving forward. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Commissioner. And so we're going to shift gears, but I think it's also important um, to recognize as we go to our, our higher ed conversation that um, that the, the K-12 conversation doesn't stop there because some of these concepts are going to relate to our higher ed conversation as well. And so as we continue the conversation for our, our college presidents that are on, you know, I ask you to think about some of these, these pieces, these nuggets um, as we continue the conversation. And so I'm actually going to start with uh, President Katsileas, who's on with us. We also have a bunch of other distinguished um, guests on, and, and we'll get you know we'll get to those names as we we get through the questions. Um, but I want to start with students. Um, obviously, you know we're, we're thinking about student safety, and so President Katsileas from UConn, you know, congratulations on 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 the graduation that just happened. Um, but we know that students have taken a huge emotional toll um, as a result of this crisis. And so can you share with us, um, you know, how that has played out um, on campus and maybe the need for additional investment in this area for your students? Yeah, uh, thank, thank you so much, Chris. Um, yeah, the, the, I think the hardest adjustment for our students has been uh, the, the emotional toll. I, I meet with dozens of students in person and online and I ask them, what has been most difficult for you about this crisis? Is it the academic adjustment or the social adjustment? And so far, not one single student has said it's the academic adjustment. So um, it's, a, it's a struggle uh, to deal with it. And they're very anxious to come back and um, return to being on campus. And we're, we're focused on doing all we can uh, to get the students, the faculty and the staff back as soon as possible and as safely as possible. This governor's working group uh, has been extremely helpful in that regard because it allows us to share best practices, new ideas that each of us has. Uh, and um, it gives us some common base, uh, which Rick Levine and chairing the committee provided for us what he called the gating conditions. And you know those, those being that hospitalizations have gone down, that we have the tools in place to do testing of all of our students to keep them safe and so on. Uh, but beyond that, each of our schools is different, and we're, you know, trying to learn from each other, but trying to figure out how best to keep our students safe and get them back at, at each school. Um, 
the, you know, there are going to be some investments we need to be, to make in order to do this. Obviously, we're going to we're going to have to do the, the testing is the number one investment, I would say. And uh, yeah, a lot has been said about how important testing is for businesses to get back to work and society to get back to work. And I just can't emphasize enough um, how complex a campus is from a public health point of view. You know, they they bring together large numbers of people to um, from different backgrounds to have these intellectual collisions that makes them such exciting places uh, for learning. But that same excitement is what makes them so incredibly challenging from a public health point of view. And so that gating condition uh, and the need to prioritize whatever testing we have capacity we have in the state for education, particularly residential education as a priority, it, it needs to be a state and national priority if we're going to get you know, the state running again, reopen Connecticut. It starts with those residential campuses and and uh, and that's going to be the biggest investment, I would say. Thank you, Tom. Um, you know, and something that you said kind of in the beginning, you know, not only getting students back to campus, but also obviously our faculty back to campus. And so um, I want to turn to um, President Joanne Berger Sweeney, President of Trinity College. Uh, you're on the on the line with us. Thank you, President, for being with us. And so I actually have a two part question for you. You know, obviously not only students being comfortable getting back to campus, but faculty getting you know being comfortable getting back to campus. And so you know, number one, you know, how do we reassure someone um, you know with with you know maybe pre existing health conditions? being comfortable getting back to campus. So let's start with that one. And, and what are some of the things that we can do as administrators to, to make sure that, that they're walking onto a safe campus? Right. So um, thank you for your question. And I just want to acknowledge how much I learned in the K through 12 conversation that preceded this. Mm. And I think many of the concerns that were expressed by, you know, teachers in the K through 12 arena are questions that also faculty members have at independent colleges such as Trinity College, which I represent. I have made it very clear to our faculty and staff and students that we will come back to campus when it is safe to come back to campus, recognizing that may not mean that every member can come back to campus at the same time. We know that there are faculty members, staff members, as well as students who have pre existing health conditions, who are perhaps at an age where they are at higher risk. So I think our job is to make sure that there are opportunities for remote learning where those who cannot physically come back to campus, and that could be for physical or psychological reasons, have the opportunity to teach. The question in my mind that's primary is, how do you make that an excellent educational experience, whether it's some need to do it online, whether others can be here face to face, we're going to have to accommodate both. Thank you, President uh, Berger Sweeney. And, you know, you mentioned remote learning being a huge component of how we move forward. Right. We have Dr. Rick Levin on uh, with us. And, you know, Dr. Levin, you've been a champion um, of online pedagogy. And so, and when we moved, um, you know, particularly higher education institutions kind of moved to keeping students home, um, they were ahead of, of the game, especially uh, ahead of K-12 on, on doing the distance learning. So can you talk about uh, the role of e-learning and how this is going to develop um, in, as, as the pandemic kind of um, rolls out and, and develops? Sure, thank you, Chris. Um, also want to acknowledge that uh, it was a very informative discussion at the beginning about that K-12 and um, I think it was helpful to us. Um, it was a very interesting transition when we shut down the state in uh, March because immediately, you know, virtually every teacher who had uh, a class underway at the university level went online. Now they went online 
in what I would say is essentially the most primitive way to go online. It's Zoom video calls, just like this one. And, and that's, um, that, that is useful. It works reasonably well in small group discussions. It's not particularly well suited to someone giving a 50 minute lecture. Um, uh, and, it, and of course it went on, people went online without all the tools that really the best forms of online instruction currently have, which would be all kinds of supplemental materials that are online, animations, ga gamification of content, um, interactive experiences for students. That these things are available in some of the best, uh, you know, online courses that are that that have you know, been prepared for the last several years and are available actually for K through 12 as well as uh, college age students. Um, one of the opportunities that the summer has provided is that it will allow many of our institutions to focus on training their faculty to provide richer and better online experiences for their students. And Joanne Berger Sweeney was mentioning that. We want that, that if we have to do that, we want it to be a first class experience. And one of the things that we, of course, we, we recommend is very similar to what some of the people said this morning. We, we want to be open in the, in the fall, particularly residential institutions. We want to bring the students back to campus, but the, the health conditions in the state may not warrant it at the time. If we don't have, you know, um, a sort of steady decline to a low level of incidence of the disease, and we indeed are experiencing a second wave come late August, we may have to go online. Um, and, or if there's not adequate testing capacity to test people on coming back to school, we may have to go online. So schools have to be flexible, universities have to be flexible um, and able to play both ways. Because I think if you think about the entire school year ahead, there are going to be uh, occasions where uh, being online might make sense. For example, we have one example. Um, many schools are thinking about um, ending the first semester at Thanksgiving so that students don't have to go home and come back to campus for that for this first couple of weeks of December. So you can imagine a mode of the fall semester, which would be students are in place from September 1 to Thanksgiving. They go home, do their last classes online and their exams online, and come back after the Christmas holidays in January, which might be a very intelligent way to run this from a public health point of view, because it would avoid a kind of high incidence period of the disease in December. So we need to be prepared to be online. That's excellent. I mean, you know, between everything that we said, starting with uh, President Katsileas to everything that you said, I think, you know, we can't forget about the financial resources and strains that colleges are under right now. And I, I want to bring it to President Ojakian, who's on with us. Um, you know, there's there's no question that that the pandemic has taken a toll on financial strength on, fi on the financial resources of colleges um, as we talk about in enrollment declines, projections. And so President Ojakian, you know, as we think about some of the flexibilities that colleges need to, to think about um, for the fall and, and into the future, you know, enrollment projections, you know, what are the what are the things that colleges need to think about, you know, managing finances and, and changes and the economic challenges that, that colleges are going to need to to weather as we think about uh, the future? Well, thank you, Chris. Um, I'd like to start off by saying I think that we've all experienced some really hard financial uh, realizations this past semester. Um, as we had to close down in mid-March, um, I'm going to speak for my. Um, we refunded room and board to students who were no longer able to, you know, live on campus and and take advantage of the dining halls on campus. And that was about $25 million in refunds for a short period of time. So if that uh, continues, that trend continues into the fall, it's really going to provide some some uh, pressure on all of our collective financial um, systems. I think as we look to the fall, we're going to have to be creative as we develop our plans on how to be attract students um, back to where we are in terms of the um, is it is the trajectory down or is it coming back up again, which is why public health guides what we do and has to continue to guide what we do. Um, I would also just so like to make a couple of other points. First of all, the the way that fact
truly incredible. And so I want to thank all the faculty out there um, who just who made this all happen. It was difficult for students. It was difficult for faculty, and they did an incredible job. And then the other point I wanted to make is speaking for the system that I'm that I'm honored to lead. Many of the students that we have are the parents of the K through 12 system, right? So imagine being a community college who's a parent, has two children, for example, has a hard enough time going to school on, on a normal situation with transportation and childcare and working one or two jobs. Now, all of a sudden, you may have lost your job. You're home with your child. You're trying to take your classes while your child is trying to take their classes. We can't forget the incredible strains that are on the students uh, that we all serve. This only tends to exacerbate equity gaps. It also tends to leave some students behind. And in spite of our best efforts to reach everybody, I think we have a responsibility to continue to improve on how we reach all of our students and continue to do better as we look towards reopening um, in the fall. But there's no question that finances are going to continue to be front and center as we look to reopen safely uh, in the fall. Thank you, Mark. Um, you know, one thing that, that you said um, that I think has been a topic of conversation, no matter whether you look at the health side, education side, is about equity. And so I wonder if, you know, to the to the group in general, um, how do we, you know, try to mitigate the impact um, of, you know, exacerbating inequities um, as we move forward? And I, I want to put it out to everyone because I want to make sure that we we have our experts on this call, you know, addressing this because this is what people want to know um, who are tuned in. And so I, I want to make sure that we address it and they hear it from us so that way we're not skirting it and they know that it's at the top of our minds. And so I think if, if we can have a couple of people um, get to that, that'd be great. Well, I'll, I'll offer one, one, one idea, uh, which is this. The, the, um, safety, the health conditions prevail in um, non-residential programs, make it quite a bit more safe to, for those to open sooner and, uh, than residential programs. I mean, non-residential programs are much similar, much more similar to office work or other kinds of businesses that are reopening. Um, and our, in our report, we actually recommended that many of those programs could open as early as June, um, particularly ones that involve vocational training where students are well-spaced in laboratories or clinics or, or shops. Um, and in, so in a sense, if you look at the kinds of programs that will reopen early and probably pose much lower risk of transmission within the, within the college community, um, I think you'll find it will tend to bias in favor of the community colleges and, and non-residential programs, which is where a lot of working students, part-time students, indeed the, the least economically advantaged students tend to concentrate. So in at least that one sense, the, the phased reopening is going to, if anything, not exacerbate inequality, but actually in part correct it. Chris, I'd like to take a, a stab at that question Please. too. Um, so the first, I, I'm really glad that you asked a question about equity. And the answer is the only way that we can address it is through a combination of factors and an entire community working together. So I'm gonna start by reminding people that independent colleges such as Trinity and even such as Yale, we put significant portions of our endowment towards financial aid, significant portions. And every institution from the smallest to the largest is going to have pressure on financial aid because people will need more money to be able to come to school. What 
whatever institution you're talking about from community colleges to the most expensive. So a number of independent colleges, I can assure you, will be using their endowments judiciously to be able to support equity in the way that we always do it. However, if we do not have additional resources from the federal government, the state governments, and the local governments, we're not going to be able to bear the burdens of the entire society and the necessity for education and the fact that it's going to require more resources for us to deliver our mission. So certainly we as independent institutions are going to be doing what we can in terms of the use of our resources, but it will go way beyond what we are capable of doing ourselves. And if, as I said, the federal, state, and local governance do not help us, we will not be able to provide um, equity across different socioeconomic levels because Marco Jakian has suggested all of our traditional resources, revenue sources are going to be, um, you know, under strain. The other thing I, I do want to remind people is besides um, tuition revenues and room and board revenues and auxiliary revenues that we have in all of our institution, there is also philanthropy. There are people who care about our mission that are supporting what we do and making sure that we're offering our education as equitably as possible. But we, as institutions ourselves, will not be able to do it alone without significant support, external support. So um, that's how I wanna answer um, the equity question. We still care and care deeply. It's part of our fundamental mission, but we cannot do it alone. So Chris, um, if I could jump in and I just, I Joanne answered that that question so beautifully. There's just a couple of added points. Cato Lorenzen, a faculty member at UConn, has done a study of the disproportionate impacts of the COVID virus on uh, underrepresented, underserved groups. And there, there is a larger impact both uh, 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 on a physical health basis um, on uh, minority communities and as well as um, uh, socioeconomically. And so um, to Joanne's point though, the key is prioritizing our financial aid to ensure that uh, students can complete their degrees uh, and are not prevented from completing their degrees because of the, the financial impact of, uh, of, the, of the epidemic. And so philanthropy, as, as Joanne said, is key. Um, we've been fortunate to, uh, to um, have support from local uh, local uh, providers, internet providers who provided um, free Wi-Fi for our students who didn't have access to it, and we've been able to lend them laptops so that so that all students were able to get access to the technology at home. Or if their home situation wasn't conducive to learning and wellness, they, about a thousand students stayed in our residence halls. So that's how how we're trying to approach it, but it is a, an important challenge. I would say, this is Fran from the um, K-12. I would say certainly um, the COVID um, uh, pandemic has made it more apparent, but this opportunity gap has um, existed for as long as my career is there and longer than that. And I do believe that the fact that it's um, taking a very prominent position in all of our discussions is very heartening. I do also see philanthropy entering in, the Partnership for Connecticut, the Dalio Foundation, um, giving um, 60,000 computers to um, our children uh, really helped. I do think, as has been said, resources are incredibly important and so is good leadership being able to um, take those resources and use them in a in a ver in a way that impacts um, the children most in need. And to Rick Levin's point, 
Um, online learning has to become part of the K-12 education program. And we have to find better ways to ensure that we're engaging every child in it, whether that child has um, disabilities or doesn't have Wi-Fi, et cetera. We've got to find ways because it's going, we, we just can't tolerate um, a learning loss that may be three or four months and may continue in the fall or be exacerbated in the fall. So we, and I'm very heartened by this committee, by having all the perspectives and all the stakeholders feeding into us um, that we will find better innovative ways to um, definitely impact the opportunity gap that has existed and continues to exist. Um, yes, uh, this is Beth by uh, from the Office of Early Childhood. A couple of things. I think this committee is really important that we feel the tension uh, between how important school is for children's brains, how important structure and routine is for families, what an important role schools play really uh, for childcare, and the tension around public health. I think we've got to feel both, and the input this committee has received just over the past 24 hours, I think, really helps with that because I have concerns as a developmental psychologist about children's brain development at this time without that structure and routine in their lives. So I, I said earlier, uh, we have a lot of choices that one isn't worse than the other. We have no really great choices here, but we're letting public health be the guide, which is important. I wanted to speak about equity uh, related to young children with disabilities, uh, because at this time, uh, a lot of those children are getting the usual supports they would get, again, at a time when their brains are so uh, ready for input and ready for intervention in ways that help them in the long run. Uh, as, a, as an example, uh, Birth to Three, which our program oversees, has seen a real drop in referrals. That means children are going to get to intervention later because children haven't gone to pediatricians, a lot of preschools and early childhood programs are closed, so those referrals aren't out there. So for those of you listening at home, if you have friends who are worried about their child's development, please have them call 211 Child Development Info Line and ask uh, for a referral uh, because our birth to three providers are working hard to do tele-intervention. Uh, it's been really successful, but I think families are so overwhelmed, they're having trouble signing up. So I think that's important. And also just the access to uh, early childhood special education services uh, for the three to five-year-olds. Uh, Commissioner Cardona and I collaborated in a way with and worked with the governor to get an executive order to allow birth to three to continue with families after they turn three because the schools aren't open. And this has been a great intervention. Um, but I think that we have to be concerned about those things and looking for solutions, which I know this committee is, I know our office is, I know the State Department of Ed is, but we want to continue to hear from families. And also maybe some of you out there have ideas about how we can reach out and get more <laughs> families with young children who may have developmental delays into services. Uh, thanks. Can I just follow up one thing Beth, Beth said and um, that is, that is, I, I firmly believe uh, segments of our student population that have traditionally had difficulty um, navigating uh, through their socioeconomic um, um, uh, situations are finding it more difficult than ever with this transition. Online. And we just have to all, I think, be sensitive. To, and, and some of those populations the LGBTQ youth are having a very difficult time now um, living in situations that may not be safe, that they're having um, um, issues not only with their education, but with their home life. And I think we as a community need to do a better job at understanding who's out there, um, what they need, and how we can better address those needs as well. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Beth. Um, Commissioner, I wanted to turn, uh, Commissioner Cardona, I want to see if you had any last words. We're getting to the top of the hour. I want to be respectful of people's time. And so did you have any other last words on, on, on the equity um, conversation um, before we close out? Thank you, uh, 
Thank you, Chris, and and thank you to everyone. And, you know, this has been a a wonderful conversation. Obviously, we just touched the tip of the iceberg. We got a lot of work to do, and and I think you know what you can hear from this group, all of us, is this is our collective call to action as educators, as leaders. Together, we're united on not only addressing the gaps that came as a result of COVID, but reimagining education to make it better than it was before March 12th to address some of the gaps and some of the issues we had before COVID. So uh, we're all committed to doing so in a way that really makes education in Connecticut even better than it was before, um, while keeping in mind that safety has to be a priority that we have not only now and in the summer as we plan for the fall, but moving forward uh, for years to come. So I look forward to being a part of this work with everyone. And I thank you for your commitment. Thank you those that are listening for your comments, for your thoughts. We definitely take those into account when we're, when we're making decisions. Thank you for joining us. I wanna thank all our, our uh, panelists who are on, took the time. Thank you again, uh, most importantly to all of the public that tuned in. Uh, we're gonna keep getting this information out to you. So that way you know, and you're better informed this, uh, committee is working day and night on overdrive to ensure um, that we're doing this in a safe uh, manner as possible. So Max, I'm gonna turn it over to you unless you have anything else. And if not, uh, thank you very much for joining us today.